you got your Bible this morning, bring your Bible to church. This is the analog version. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, um, I want to announce this. After each service, um, if you want to, uh, off camera, when we close out the, the live stream portion of the service, if you want healing or want prayer, not just healing, but prayer for any matter whatsoever, uh, we'll be here to do it. If you come to the church and you, and you wear a mask, which is fine, okay, and I see you come down for the prayer line um, and you're wearing a mask, I'll put mine on. Okay, is that fair enough? And then uh, we'll keep the COVID thing safe and everything else is going good. Um, but if you do want prayer, we do want to be able to pray with anybody who wants prayer and chance to minister. This is how church used to be before we went live stream. We used to be very personable. We used to give hugs instead of airwaves, <laughs> you know, and different things like that. But uh, we'll get back. It's coming back. So, but one thing we've been noticing last week, I did a water baptism. We had the service. We had a water baptism. And I forgot to mention about the prayer at the end of the service. And my wife came up with it. She said, and I was amazed on how many people stayed after the service and then stayed and then stayed. <laughs> and then, I loved it. It was great. It, I mean, it, it's, it's, that's what happens when God moves. And, and we believe that, that, that God was doing a, a real work, uh, people getting healed and so on and so forth. Amen. I say this, too. If you come down, to, we lay hands on you. Uh, you will experience pain will go. You'll experience the healing. If something happens, it comes back again. Uh, this is what I tell you. Let's do it again yes. and again and again. But the fact is, how many know the devil wants to bring sickness and disease? He wants to keep torment. Uh, but this is what I'm going to lay on the congregation. Go home, get in prayer with the word of God, and find out where the doors open. Let's close it. Amen. But we will pray whatever it takes. Amen. Don't uh, be ashamed. Don't feel like you're, you're lack, your, your faith is lacking. Not at all. Not here. Um, uh, the more we can hit the devil, the better we like it. Yes, amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, amen. So every, if I forget, <laughs> say, Pastor, what about prayer at the end? We'll do it. We will do it. Praise the Lord. Uh, and that prayer is not just for healing, by the way. We've had a lot of people here, but that is for anything at all. Uh, you can share the need if you want to. You can keep it to yourself. We have people that stand in for other people, uh, family members, loved ones, whatever it is. Whatever God lays on your heart, I don't want to. I want to leave every opportunity open uh, for us to do it. If we'll stay, I'll stay here till next Tuesday praying for people. It doesn't matter to me. Um, so I've been to the mission field several times. I've prayed for big crowds, small crowds, big churches, small crowds. It doesn't matter. We stay until it's done. I was I was invited to church one time up in uh, just outside of Atlanta, up in Georgia, and uh, the pastor was a friend of mine, and he said, "Would you come in and do a teaching on Blood Covenant?" I said, "Sure, I'd be glad to." And we had ministry afterwards. Uh, this one Sunday, we don't. Uh, the pastor didn't know half the people that showed up, but we had. Uh, they were bringing bus loads in. We started praying for people. Uh, well, the service started at 10:30. We started praying for people uh, about an hour or so after that, and we didn't get done until 5:30 <laughs> that afternoon. Praying for people, we loved it. Man, not only that, we got well, we went to the restaurant, we fellowshiped there, we talked about this. I mean, I love to see victories in, in the Lord. I really love it. I, I mean, I'll do it all day long. So praise the Lord. And uh, anyway, I wanted, uh, the title of my message this morning is The Realities in, of Redemption. The Realities of Redemption I want to share uh, this morning. Uh, uh, before I start with my message, I, I, I picked up this quote I thought was pretty good. This is a quote. I want to re read this for you. Uh, I got online. Uh, but a quote by... Uh, William Booth, I don't know if you remember, William Booth was a, was a founder uh, of the Salvation Army, which is the organization we see today. This was his quote. Now, this is going back in a number of years. He says, I consider that the chief uh, uh, changers, or ch I'm, I'm sorry, chief dangers uh, that confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, and salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Out of those six things, how many things do you think are happening today? I'll read the list again. It's pretty good. He says, he, he says, uh, the, uh, Christi um, he says, a religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, Praise the Lord. 
and heaven without hell. So let's just teach the, uh, I think one person said the, the gummy pair of preaching. You know, uh, Paul puts it this way. Paul divides this uh, in Hebrews. I believe Paul is a writer of the Hebrews, by the way. Uh, but he, he says it this way. He says, um, uh, he categorizes the word of God into two categories, milk and meat. The difference in those two categories, milk soothes and comforts. Amen. Meat promotes change or provokes change. So that's the two difference. So, so uh, I shared with my staff this morning, we were in the war room, and I said, I really see God uh, bringing this instance of meat. Uh, and, and, but he's promoting change within the church. I, I can't tell you how many things have changed in this past year, uh, fueled somewhat by the pandemic, but just because of God uh, giving us uh, information, give us insight, uh, and, 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 and uh, continuing on with his plan. I love it. Uh, the, the latest thing is that we're, we're all seeking, the, our staff is, up, is getting into the presence of God. I seek that stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, I can wake up in the morning and uh, I just think about the Lord. I said, Lord, I just want to be in your presence. Even before I get out of bed, I just want to be in your presence. Uh, and, and during the day, I want to be in your presence. And uh, we were, Diane and I went diving uh, this week. We went diving a couple times. And I, I, I'm, I'm an avid scuba diver. And I like to go deep. I like to do wrecks and do all this other stuff. Uh, uh, other people consider dangerous that I enjoy. Uh, but we, we had an ins- a, a, a thing, at the, the water, it was kind of an odd, situ- odd day, but the top for the, about the ter- first 40 feet, uh, we dove quite deeper than that, but the, the first 40 feet was nothing but a white out silt. And I thought, man, I said, you know, we're, we're pulling ourselves along the line, because there was a, a line that goes down to the mooring ball and, and get, goes on to the wreck. Then all of a sudden, we got past that, and it opened up. So it went from like 10 foot of visibility to like 70 foot. And I thought to myself, I said, isn't that like the revelation of God? Amen. We're clouding, we're trying to figure this out, and all of a sudden, we just get deep enough, and all of a sudden, it opens up, I see clearly. How many's ever been hit with that realization that, man, all of a sudden, God just, like, a, a light goes off, and ding, I see that. Well, this morning is kind of like that as far as the Scripture. Uh, the, I've preached the Scripture before, but I, I want to uh, preach it again. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, you can turn in your Bibles if you want. Galatians chapter 2, there's two epistles that Paul wrote that are tops in my book, and they couldn't be more different. <laughs> there's the book of Ephesians, which has zero rebuke. There is zero correction in any, any of the book of Ephesians. And, and uh, the church of Ephesus was quite a fantastic church. Uh, but then there's the book of, of Galatians, which Paul is defending his doctrine. And, and it's quite the opposite. Uh, but there's a lot of, of good meat uh, in the Galatians. So if I took the two, well, both of them are good meat words. But the, uh, but the book of Galatians... Uh, chapter 2, I'm going to read this morning, says this, chapter 2 and verse 20. Let me go ahead and read the scripture. It says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. I'm reading out of the King James book uh, for this verse. I'll, sh- I'll share why in a minute. It says, uh, liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, the life that I live in the flesh, this is the life that you and I see, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, this, that's, that's verse uh, 20. Verse 21 is kind of interesting because this is what verse 21 says. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Paul, in the book of Galatians, was, was standing up, uh, Jew and Gentile alike. But to the religious crowd, he writes this, he was defending our, the, the doctrine of, of saved by faith and the, and the grace of God. Two, two things, the grace of God. Being I mentioned the grace of God, let me, let me point this out. In many circles of doctrine, the grace of God is, we would, a definition for the grace of God would be unmerited favor. However, that definition does not line up with all Scripture because the definition of uh, mer- unmerited favor, because Paul clearly said you can fall from grace. Well, how can you fall from unmerited favor? Amen. Not only that, uh, go to point to the Savior himself. The Bible says that he grew in grace. So did Jesus himself grow in unmerited favor? No, no if anybody merited, he did. 
<laughs> I'll give you that right there. So, so praise the Lord. So, but what is a proper definition for grace, studying what Paul said about grace, because he, he was the apostle that knew inside and out about grace. But we usually say it this way, instead of unmerited favor, the empowering presence of God enabling me to be what he's called me to be so I can do what he's called me to do. Amen. Can I use that this morning for that? So when I talk, I mention grace, that's the definition I want. He said, I do not frustrate the grace. Now, the King James is kind of interesting because that word frustrate means this. Now, listen to the definition. This is out of, out of the uh, Strong's uh, concordance. But I just took the word, the Greek word, that English word is frustrate. To frustrate, this is the Greek word, this is what it means. To set aside, neutralize, violate, cast off, despise, disable, reject. He says, if I frustrate or if I set aside, neutralize, violate, cast off, despise, disable or reject the grace of God, then he says, Christ has died for me in vain, or let me put it this way. For vanity. Did Christ die for vanity's sake? No. So he says, he says no. Now we see, for if righteousness comes by, it's what the verse says, for if righteousness comes by the law. Now let's take that word law, because if he's talking to the Jewish people, they're thinking Torah. But he's not only talking to Jewish people, because the church of Galatia was a church in Turkey. There were several churches that were Galatian churches uh, all through uh, the region of Turkey. So he's talking to several churches with this letter. And he's, he's saying this, he, so when he mentions the law, he's not just talking about the law of Moses, he's not just talking about the Ten Commandments. What he's saying, he says, your religious acts that trump the crucifixion of Christ, if I could say it that way. The religious acts that you do in replacement of what God has done for us. In other words, if we're trying to earn our salvation in any kind of way, because with the Jew, it was the law. Uh, uh, we read the Torah, we do this, we do this, we, we, we have morning, prayer, morning and evening prayer, uh, we do this, and those make us righteous. Remember the Pharisees. You understand something about the Pharisees with the, with the biggest opposition to Jesus and his earthly ministry, and they're the most religious, the most upstanding people as far as clean living with the Pharisees. Oh, you couldn't get them to smoke or chew or go with girls that do. They had, I mean, they were, a Pharisee would not walk down the street close to his wife, his wife, because he didn't want anybody misconstruing that he was fraternizing with a, a strange woman if they didn't know him. So the wife had to walk certain paces behind the Pharisee so nobody would misunderstand, him, uh, as, be accused of sin. That's the law that Paul is talking about. And their righteousness came from that. When Christ died, no, 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 no. You can't do your works to earn what Christ did. He said that's vanity Amen. and it's vain. Hmm. Yes, I'll read it again. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Uh, I don't set aside, neutralize, violate, cast off, despise, disable, or reject. This is what... God has been speaking to me for a while. He says to, to, to hunger and thrive for the presence of God. Is God real to you? Yes. Is he a real person? Yes. Uh, I had, my father passed a, a, a year or so ago. I says, but my dad, when I'm growing up, uh, if I needed something, if I want, I went to my dad. I didn't make an appointment. I busted in on him. I annoyed him. I kept asking until I got what I wanted. Are you here? This is my natural dad. So when the father says to me, he says, I want you to come in under the father. Jesus made, us, made the way that we can go to the father. He said, in that day, ask me nothing. But ask the father in my name. So we have permission to go into the father without appointment, without a, and ask the father anything. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we ask him for some pretty stupid things, don't we? In comparison of what Jesus has done, it'd be pretty dumb. I mean, some of the stuff we ask him, uh, uh, Lord, can I have a nice day so I can go diving? Really? That's all, out of all the things we need, the church, uh, you're going to ask me for a nice day to go diving? Uh-huh. <laughs> and he generally gives it. <laughs> But the relationship with the Father, this is something you're not going to learn in religion. This is something that a lot of 
people don't, cannot teach you because maybe they don't know themselves. Amen. Or maybe we've lost something in the translation of the Bible uh, where Paul is saying, oh, I don't frustrate the grace. Christ to me is die, did not die in vain. He died so I can have access to the Father. Yeah. He goes on to say, let me, let me read another scripture. Oh, let me give you this first. If we talk about crucifixion, because we talk about uh, how am I crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, I live. The crucifixion didn't kill me, didn't put me in the and I didn't have to raise from the dead. Now, water baptism, we had a water baptism last Sunday. Uh, the water baptism is a symbol of that. So what is happening? What does it mean for us? How many like to know the answer to that question? All right, come back next week. Right after the offering, I'll give you the answer. No, I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'll give you the answer. But, uh, uh, but when, we, when we water baptize, we tell people that want to be baptized, do you understand what, what this is about? If not, we'll, we'll school you in it. But it's important to be water baptized knowing what it's for. Yes, sir. We go under the water in water baptism represents the death and burial of Christ. When we come up, we say, now arise in newness of life. That's a new creation. So what is that? That's identifying what we say this. Water baptism becomes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I, I turn this way because if you, if you haven't seen it, uh, this big door here, eight foot square door opens up and there's a baptistry underneath it. We can, we can uh, load that thing up in 40 minutes and I can have you wet in 42. Amen. We do that on purpose because I noticed that Paul, when he was in prison, he f baptized that Philippian jailer in the middle of the night. That seemed to be an urgency to that. So we made it an urgency to this church. We don't wait for a baptism Sunday or a baptism month. We don't have a baptism uh, month, six months or whatever. No, no. It's upon request we can do a water baptism. Can't we, deacons? Hallelujah. God bless you. Hallelujah. We can, we can fill that thing up. If you can wait around for 45 minutes, we'll have you done. Yeah. Amen. We'll have you done. It's that important because what happens, the identification of the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is so important. It is the basis of everything that we are. Yes, sir. Everything that we are. Everything hinges on that. Crucifixion comes before resurrection, obviously. Resurrection comes before redemption. It's redemption that moves us into the realization of our identity Discovered identity brings us, in, brings us, brings revelation of purpose. I'll say that again. Crucifixion comes before resurrection. So this is why Paul said, I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It comes before resurrection. And, and he said, the life that I now live, because he's alive, so therefore there's a resurrection. Crucifixion comes before resurrection. Resurrection comes before redemption. You cannot have a redemptive process without Jesus being dead, buried, and raised from the dead, and coming back, that now becomes a redemption of our redemption. Can you remember, somebody say amen? Amen. All right. Come on. Amen. I know I'm alone up here, but I shouldn't be alone out there. Praise the Lord. Are you here? All right. So it's redemption that moves us into a realization of our identity. This is our identity. This is who we are. Yes, sir. It's not Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Pentecostal, full gospel. It's not that. It is we are Christians. First of all, we are Identify with Christ. Amen. And he did this for us. This is who we are. Yes. Hmm. This is amazing. Because a lot of, I, I got to point that out, identity. Because the identity that, uh, that I grew up in, I'll speak for myself. I can testify about myself. Testify about you, you get mad. But I testify about myself. I grew up in a religion that basically it, my identity came from how I did the sacraments, or the identity came from how I did church, or whether I went or not. If I didn't go to church, then what happens, somehow I lost my identity. Well, you're not a very good Lutheran Methodist, or you fill in the blanks. You're not a very good that because you're not going to church. Now, granted, we miss people that don't go to church. Awful, but not for the same reason. Not because you lost your identity or we want you to. No, because basically what happens in the time and hour we live in, uh, the, the church gathering is our fellowship. It's commanded of the scriptures yes. in Hebrews, but it's also our building up of one another. Amen. Praise God. There's power in agreement, the Bible puts out. If two of you shall cut, two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the spirit. So guess what? The government of God comes down to three people. To us, th get me three people in agreement, and we'll have church. That's right. Yes, sir. Amen? Hallelujah. That's it. Amen. 
Now, it's nice to have a full church, and, and it's nice that the churches have mega churches and, and they're reaching more people. God bless them. But Jesus only needs three. We may need more because it pumps to our um, pride and, and uh, other things. But the fact is, he said, no, you get three to gather, gather together. He said, I'll be right there. Hmm. So this is, anyway, enough about that. He goes on to say, say of course, let me finish the statement again. Uh, discovered identity brings revelation of purpose. How many has ever wondered what their purpose was here? We know we have a purpose because once you got born again, he didn't whisk you out of here because he's afraid of you backsliding. Amen? All right, praise the Lord. So we have a purpose. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us redeemed us from the curse of the law, having made a curse for us. He takes that out of Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. That the blessings of Abraham, important, blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentile Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. What I used to do, I used to say, you want to know what you've been redeemed from? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, read the entire chapter, and then go back to Galatians 3, 13, that tells you what you've been redeemed from. <laughs> so uh, it, also, it also will tell you what you're in line for, uh, not only but redeemed from. So he's redeemed us. Do we, know what mean, do we know what these words mean or we just use them because we hear them in church? I looked up the word redeemed. He redeemed us. Here's what it means, the rescue from laws. That's pretty simple. How about this one? This isn't, this isn't so common. Improved opportunity. Redeemed to improve opportunity. So the redemption of Christ will improve your opportunity. Right. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Improved opportunity. Redemption is a restoration of design. Sin is an operation outside of design. When we sin, we're operating on the outside of our design, what we're designed for. Amen. Okay? Redemption is a stopping of the cycle of sin. How many know that God said this? In the earth, he says, sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest shall remain as long as the earth remains. How many remember that scripture? Who did he say that to? That is Noah. He said, right after the flood, he said, seed time and harvest. We say this spiritually. We say, well, okay, the words of our mouth plant seeds. The seeds come in and produce a harvest. Correct? That you also see in Proverbs where it says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. There's two opposite things. Life and death are two opposite opponents that come out of the same mouth. And the same, they come out of the same life. So guess what happens? Seed time, when it comes out of our mouth, basically uh, we, uh, it, uh, there's a cycle of sin. There's a cycle of plant, planting that redemption tears up. When Jesus went to the cross... And he stood on the cross, the curses of the world and all the things fell upon him. So it happens, that cycle of seed time and harvest on the other end of it, on the cursing, was reversed at the cross because Jesus sat there and was burdened with the entire sin process of the world upon, his, uh, upon him. So in, in, in light, through him, took off of us the burden of sin that was on us and put it on him. Now, Seed time, how many know all you got to do is take a seed, stick it in the ground, and walk away, and the seed will take its, will take its if it takes root, it'll br bring forth the fruit. That's seed time and harvest. Uh, you don't have to be a farmer to figure that one out. Amen? And the things that we do, the things that we said, have a, a seed effect. Long after we walk away from the situation, we still have a harvest there. Long, uh, long after we're far out of the reaches of that thing, there's still a harvest there. Amen. Christ is saying, the redemptive process, I've pulled up your weeds. Yes, sir. I've stopped the harvest that is out to destroy you in the form of a curse. Amen. And I put instead in that place, I poured out blessings. How did he do that? On the cross, he took the cursings from us. And this is what Paul's saying here. That Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curse of anyone that hangeth upon the tree. The tree being the wood or the cross. Uh, you, you get the, uh, the acronym in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 23. That the blessings there the might come upon the Gentile, Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise through the Spirit. We receive the promise through the Spirit, through faith. Amen. So our faith in action. Hallelujah. Help anybody this morning. Yes, amen. Amen. So what God did, he basically came in, took the reaping of our sin unto himself, 
and in exchange gave us what is his. So what we were planting, all the bad seed we were planting, all the things that crop up in our life that cause us to despair and destruction and everything else. Jesus said, no, no, I'll take that. And what I'll give you in its place, I'm giving you everything that I have given you. Everything that I have is yours. And I'm taking away the curse that's off of you and placed it unto me. And there's a greater exchange. That is redemption. You can't sugarcoat that in, a, in some kind of religious act. There is nothing you can do uh, uh, to earn that because that would be vanity. Then it becomes your problem. Then you become your God, not serving the one true God. If there's anything you can do on your own in this process, it becomes vain. This is what Paul is saying. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. No, I can't, nevertheless I live, only because of Christ in me. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me, he says. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, I do not frustrate the grace of God. As long as I can get this principle down, that Christ's living in me, because I've asked him to come in. Here's the thing. Well, how come God is a sovereign God? How come he just doesn't do something? Problems in the world? How come he just doesn't do Put it and fix it. Because basically the deed title, how many have, how many, uh, have a lease and they rent? Do you know if you, I shared this thing last week, but if I, if, you, if I had a house, I owned a house, I got the deed title free and clear, and I rent that house out to you, do you know that legally I cannot go in your house as long as you're renting from me, unless I'm invited? Even though I own the house, I cannot do anything. The only thing I can do is if you decide to burn the place down, I can, I can, I can do something then. But as long as you're living in that house, and this is what happened when Satan... Uh, coerced Adam and Eve to sin, they had the deed title for the planet. God told them, he says, you, you are, have the authority on earth, I have the authority in heaven. So when they switched that authority, they gave the authority of earth over to Satan in that, in, in, a, in that act of sin, and basically now God sits on the outside looking, because of his word, because of what he set up, looking for a way into our life to give us what he needs. Jesus Christ applied that reversal uh, of the lease, so to speak, when he's invited and asked, now all power is given unto him, and which he says, now I'll give unto you, present power unto you when I'm invited. There's not a religious act that will do that. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing we can do to earn it. That's the grace of God. The empowering presence of God is enabling me to be what he's called me to be so I can do what he's called me to do. That's it, the empowering. The empowerment comes through Christ when he's invited. But you can live any way you want to. He's giving you a free will. You can live any way you want to. That means if I don't want to, I don't want to. I don't want to go to church, I don't go to church. If I, if I don't want, I, I don't want to. You're right. God will protect your right and your free will to go to hell if you want to. Stupid if you do, but Amen. you can do, do that. Amen? Amen? Help anybody? Yes, sir. Christ has redeemed us. He has improved opportunity. He has rescued us from loss. Amen. For curses everyone hang on a tree. The blessings of Abraham might fall upon the Gentile. Back in my college days when I was, I was a college instructor, my subject uh, when I was a Bible college instructor was um, uh, Blood Covenant. Uh, it was amazing on how few writings there were in the day, back in those days, this was about 150 years ago. Uh, <laughs> how many, how many, few writings on blood covenant, but I managed to, because I had also write the curriculum. Uh, the dean says, he says, well, I'm going to give you this course, but he said, we don't have the curriculum yet. So he says, uh, being you're going to take the course, he says, next semester, he says, you go ahead and write the curriculum. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Besides working a full-time job and doing do other things with raising a family and all this other stuff. So I, I went ahead and did it. It was one of the most eye-opening uh, blessed things that I ever have done uh, in far as giving me the understanding of what God's covenant really means. We don't understand covenant. We go to a lawyer, we drop a contract. That's not a covenant. Half, a, half of them aren't worth the paper they're written on because you can get another lawyer to turn that one over and so on and so forth, go through the legal and then some uh, goofy judge will throw that out and, he's, and on and on and on. But when they were made a covenant back in those days, it was a blood walk. They sacrificed and they swore this is what I'm going to give to you, and this is what I'm going to give to you. And they came together, whether it's two families, whether it's two men, or whatever it was. Now you're understanding, this is the understanding that we have 
Only Jesus didn't come in agreement or covenant with us. He came in covenant with himself. When he took that cross upon him and he walked on the Via Della Rosa, he was dripping with blood. The blood walk became his own blood and his feet in that blood became the blood walk. Via Della Rosa is, is, um, it means way of sorrow. All the way to the cross. Amen? He says this in the scriptures. He says, he says, he says it is imperative. Um, he said it's important. It's, uh, um, he says it's, it's to your advantage. He says in John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. What did he mean by that? Well, we, we know it as the ascension. He went to the ascension. Why? Because at the walking the planet, Jesus had a realm of authority here, though he owned the world. He chose to walk as man. So that was a choice. So if he walked as God, we could say, oh, well, that was God. I mean, I can't ever do that. But he, no, he said, you, the works that I do, you will do. And then he added another phrase, the greater works will you do. So we can't do the greater until we've done at least what he's done. <laughs> as, far, as far as the works. But he said, no, I showed you how to do it. He says, as a man, as a human being, I showed you how to do it. He says, now, he says, what, what I'm going to do. He said, it's, it's, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I just hear, I can minister in Jerusalem, I can minister to Israel, I can, uh, uh, well, if you live long, go get on an airplane and fly. But this realm right here is where I minister to. The anointing is carried by me. And it's only this around me that I can, that's gonna, I can reach. Amen. But if I go away, the comforter or the Holy Spirit comes, now the world is enveloped. And at the, at the word of the church, using the name of Jesus, now brings the power right here in, in, in a broader base. Does that make sense? Yes. So when two people made an, a blood covenant agreement, I've done seminars on this thing but, uh, years ago, but uh, I guess there's a teaching that's not used up too much anymore. But the fact is, is, is they would take an animal and they would sacrifice it. They'd cut it down lengthways in the middle and they'd lay out the two halves and make a pool of blood in the middle. They would draw up a contract. Say two families came together. One is powerful in mil military, the other is powerful in finances. They put the two co the co coven together and they become a rich military force protected by uh, one another. The family over here will now die for that family over there to keep the covenant. Okay. If they do not, the family that does over here does not have to cry foul because their own family, this covenant agreement is so powerful that the family over here will kill their own to prevent a curse from coming on them from breaking their word. You don't have to fear the other family. You have to fear your own. Because it's that important, that powerful. We, we've lost sight of these things today. I mean, we change our mind and we say things and don't, and don't carry through. And this, but a blood covenant was different. So they would walk the blood covenant. They would say, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do this. I'm laying my, my our family, all my resources here. I'm giving to you. And the other family would do something. I'm giving my resources to you. And this is just a horizontal covenant. This is just uh, back in the day. This is just between two people. God took that same type. Remember when he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, he says, he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and you're going to become the father of, of many nations. So what did he do? He put him to sleep. Abraham gets a sacrifice because he knows a covenant. He slices the animals. He puts all the carcasses down. He's got the blood. He's got everything going, and he's ready for this blood walk. He's got blood dripping from his arms from the sacrifice. He's ready for God's agreement. I'm going to give you everything I have, God, and God's going to give it to me. Only well, God didn't do it that way. He put Abraham to sleep. And when Abraham saw in a vision, God came up and consumed the entire offering. In Genesis chapter 12, the entire offering. What was God saying? He says, Abraham, you're not qualified to walk the blood walk with me. I'm, making, I'm swearing by no more powerful, the most powerful oath I can come up is by my, with myself. Amen. That reflects forward to Jesus yeah. because this was done before, this, was, this plan was made before the foundations of the world. Yeah. Let's fast forward now when Jesus, don't, when you talk about covenant, that's what he's talking about. And it's not an agreement, it's a life for life. Yes, sir. Life for life. Amen. Paul told the church back in the early day, he says, come together. When he said that, he said, forsake not the assembly together. When he said that, they could be killed. For, me, for gathering. 
it was COVID-19 and they couldn't do social distancing and, and, and the government, would, they had a capital appointment, no, I'm just kidding. But, but they could, the Roman government would, would, would take you out, feed you to the lions. If they, but he says, no, do it anyway, it's that important. He says, do it anyway, so don't forsake. Why, because basically one thing we cannot give up is the fact of what God has told us in coming together. So the church is here today, Sunday morning meetings, whether it's here or the other church, whatever, we sit here with that in our, in our, uh, our, our ancestry, that they would die before they would give up church. Not in a religious act, because that, that came over through the dark ages. Uh, it wasn't like that. It was, I want to get to my brother and sister so I can encourage them. I want to be able to release the covenant of God and healing upon them because uh, I want to be able to help them. And this whole family came together. Take out one, tie them to a stake, set them on fire, and you'd have a lineup outcry of the entire church Amen. at Nero's back door. It was those, that type of thing. There was such a tight-knit group, and God moved in the middle of it. And there's no wonder that the miracles, when did the miracles start to die off in some of the church, in, in, in the established church? I'll tell you when. When Emperor Constantine took over and brought the church in Rome and put it under one covering, also, when the church got in, in, into the agreement with government, back then it would be the Roman Empire, the supernatural began to be waned off and church became boiled down to nothing but a, 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 an affair that we just attend. <clears throat> Take it or leave it. Good for you, good for me, whatever. And the, and the crucifixion of Christ, the redemption of Christ, we lost this in the redemption. Jesus said this, Luke chapter 11, I'm going to close with this. Luke chapter 11, verse 11, I'm sorry, Luke 11, verse 20 says this. Jesus said, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. What did casting out of devils of Jesus casting out have to do with the kingdom of God coming upon us? And this is an interesting fact. He calls it the finger. He said the finger of God. So what I did, I went through and I, I looked up. There's about four different instances in the Bible that use the same terminology, the finger of God. You know, one time, I, I don't know, I, I didn't know this. That then one time, God says, uh, he says, stick out your finger. I was, I was <laughs> it might have been Africa. That, but God had me do some different things in Africa. But uh, what West Africa, he says, he says, stick out your finger. So the woman came up for healing. He said, stick out your finger. He said, take your finger like that and just tap her on the forehead like that. I didn't think nothing of it. Didn't know why. I just hit like that. And all of a sudden, she was healed. <laughs> hmm. Can I come up with a doctrine of fingers? <laughs> you know, never did it again. I, I, just, I just heard the spirit of love, never did it again. And then when I was preparing this message, I, I looked at it and said, the finger of God. I remember that. Yeah, God said, use a finger. I said, hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know. He said, but I looked it up, and here's what it is. It said, it, it said, I'll give you the scripture so you can look it up yourself. But Jesus said, if, with a finger of God, just the finger of God. Now, Matthew said, takes the same events, and he uses the Holy Spirit. He said, with the Holy Spirit, if I can cast out demons by the Holy Spirit of God, he said, the kingdom of God has come on you. So it says the same thing. But Luke puts out the finger. He said, the finger of God. So the finger of God, in a sense, would be the Holy Spirit of God. But why the finger? I, why, why did he say finger where Luke uh, went off from Matthew, Holy Spirit? I found in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Then the Lord, this is Moses speaking, he said, Then the Lord delivered unto me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord has spoken unto you, or uh, spoken to you on the mountain uh, from the midst of the fire. In other words, God took his finger. Talking with Moses, he said, we're going to record this. And he etched in the stone with his finger the commandments. We call them the Ten Commandments, uh, but the tablets. Uh, of course, how do we know? Because Moses dropped his and broke his. So how do, how, how do we know we get the accurate Ten Commandments? Uh -huh. Remember that, that covenant illustration I was giving you? There's always a second copy. But God stood there and made it two copies, and he etched it with his finger. That had to be like a laser. I don't know. How, how do you do this in solid stone? 
I mean, in the Holy Land, there's a lot of limestone, but soft stone, but I'd be still in all. Your finger, and he etched in all the things that he talked about. He was showing Moses what Moses already knew about covenant. He said, I'm going to write this down for you. So then he gives them the tablets written, written by the finger of God of what they discussed, what God told Moses he needed to do. This is what you take back to the people. So he wrote out his messages. I wish God would do it my messages sometimes. But anyway, write out the message with, with the finger of God. So the same finger that wrote the word of God is the same finger that he casts out the devil with. Are you here? The same finger was also the one he cast out the devil with. Of course, we also hear this finger of God from the other side. Remember the other camp, the Egyptians? And, 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 and Pharaoh was, was saying um, uh, God brought lice upon us and, and, and you know, plagues and everything like that. And the magician said, okay, we, 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 can, we, can, uh, uh, we can do the same kind of miracles. Well, what good does that do if you're up to your you know, uh, shoulders in, in frogs? You don't need more frogs. But they couldn't reverse what God did. They can only add to what he did. And this is what the magician said. This, in Exodus chapter 8, it said, The magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God that's causing these things. In other words, we can't overrule this, even though we can mimic and, and, and create the same thing. Remember Moses with his rod? He throws it down and becomes a snake. Oh, we can do that. Watch this trick. And they just, the only one problem is, Moses' snake ate the other three. And then Moses picks up his, okay, uh-huh, I got mine, where's yours? That's right. So the devil can come up close to do what he needs to do, but God still has it, uh, holds, uh, holds the, 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 whole, the whole thing. Now you go ahead and reverse now what, what, what uh, the devil, what, what you want to do. So you can go ahead and, and, and the devil can duplicate but he can't reverse. Amen. So Abraham, so God says, so the blessings of Abraham come upon the Gentile. Jesus said, by the finger of God, what happened was when they brought people, he called it, Luke called it the finger of God, but when Jesus began to pray for people, he took the heavenly realm that was up here and he commanded it down here where we live. And the heavenly realm that was up here with this no sickness, no disease, no poverty, no lack, no anything else that was up here now became down here. And this is what he said. He says, if I can do this with the finger of God, he said, then the kingdom of God has also come on to you. Amen. Then when Jesus, before the ascension, he gave the order. He says, you guys go preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, raise the dead, so on and so forth, and give them the whole mandate. Because now you can do it. He says, it is a, uh, it's, it's to your advantage that I go. When I go, I send forth the Comforter. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Jesus walked the earth forty days before the ascension. After after the resurrection, before the ascension, the fiftieth day is Pentecost. Pentecost is, means the number fifty. That's what it means. So it's the fiftieth day. The Jews celebrated Pentecost feast right after Passover. Passover is eight days long, and so the fiftieth day would be Passover. And they celebrate the time that God gave the law to Moses on the Mount Sinai. That's what they still celebrate today. We as Pentecostals, if you want to call us that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we celebrate that because that's the day that God poured out his Holy Spirit, where he poured out the word etched with his finger of God in the stone gave to, to Moses. Now, fast forward a few thousand years, here in the day of Pentecost, Jesus said, Go into Jerusalem and tarry until the, until, uh, the Spirit comes. Now God descends upon the, the 120 that were gathered in that room, the Holy Spirit, on the same day. So one day he pours out his word written by the finger of God. The next day he pours out his spirit that envelops Hallelujah. the entire thing to be spread across the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So in this church, we make a big deal out of Pentecost Sunday. Amen? I like Pentecost Sunday, yeah. which is the 23rd of May, I think, this year. But Pentecost Sunday, why? Because that's where we remember where the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now, what that did, that changed the entire thing, even from what Jesus is. So the greater works now are possible through the Holy Spirit. Is it just like Jesus that tells us to do something that's impossible for us to do? Yes, sir. Go out and heal the sick. Anybody here heal the sick? No. 
We cannot do it without the name of Jesus. We can't do anything that we need the name of Jesus. And it's just like Jesus to give us something to do that's impossible for us to do without including him Amen. in the doing. We can't preach the gospel. We can't do we can't anything without Jesus because it all comes from the authority. Amen? The spirit of Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Revelation 19.10, it says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So within our testimony that we testify of Christ to these things, within it is the power to change the future or the present. I, I got this. Uh, how, many, uh, how many remember the old days? Uh, uh, we used to say, Pastor, I got a testimony. And somebody sitting back at the church, oh, yeah, his sister bucket mouth. This is going to take a while. Oh, yes. And she's going to bless God. All this. I remember those days. And we would listen to a testimony given by a witness. But do you know what, what the word testimony really means in the Hebrew? To do it again. So a testimony that was given of something that happened should have been switched over now to something that is about to do again. Amen. So now when we give a testimony, uh, uh, well, God just healed my body, he does that. Why, why do we give a testimony? Because now at the hearing of a testimony delivers, because it's, it's, it's a prophe- it's a, the testimony is a prophecy of Jesus, Amen. now comes the, re- the response. Somebody can be healed just out of hearing the testimony of somebody else's healing. Right. Hallelujah. I don't have time to get into all that, but I, I, just, I just want to give that one before I ran out of time. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, but uh, it says, David writes this in Psalms 119, 88. He says, revive in me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Why? Because David realized the testimonies that came out of the works that God had done would do it again. If there's a testimony of victory over here, there's going to be another, there's going to be another do-over over here. If I can hear the testimony over here of healing, now guess what? Bless God, I can grab a hold of that. I can get healed because God wants to do it again. The word testimony means to do it again. Not just to be a witness of, but to be an involvement to. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, Pastor. I got more, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. The realities of redemption, a lot more to it than what we've probably been taught or seen before. So this morning I gave you some old or what you're familiar with, and then I give you some new, maybe not so much familiar with. But if you have a testimony, here's the hardest thing, and I've been in Key West for 30 years, 31 years, 32 years coming up. Oh my goodness, I'm getting that old. You are too, Diane. Praise the Lord. But anyway, I just... Here's the toughest thing that I have seen in, in locally in all churches in Key West. I watch the hand of God move and nobody will say anything about it. Take their healing. Thank you very much, Pastor. Run out the door and never give a testimony. And now I understand why. It's almost like the principalities of this, this community have put a gag going around Christians from testimony and things, testifying the things of God. Let me tell you right now that the, the gag order has been removed. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God. My sister now who's working in the, in, the, in the children's church was healed of cancer. Amen. Cancer free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Cancer free in the name of Jesus. Are you here? Yes. That was a miracle. She, cancer went to the, we prayed for her. It was, a, it was a Saturday night or Tuesday night. I forget what it was. And uh, she went back to the doctors and she's cancer free. Now is going through physical therapy to get her strength back. This morning is her first morning back teaching in children's church. Praise God. Why do I say that testimony? Now, at the testimony of that, bearing witness to that, somebody who's fighting cancer, even by live stream, your healing is on the way. Listen to that testimony. Grab a hold of it for yourself, and God will do the same for you. He's no respecter of persons. Amen? I had to squeeze that in at the end. I, I, I just had to get that in there because it's so important. I'm telling you, 30 years in this place, and, and, and it's like everybody's afraid to say something. I asked one person, well, what happens if it comes back? Then I just lied. No, you didn't. You testify of what, what happened. If it comes back, guess what? We know where it came from. We'll kick his booty and do it again. Are you here? Let's magnify the works of God. Forget the devil. 
Amen. Let's magnify the works of God. Who wants to bring up that rat? He's only looking for glory anyway. But let's gl glorify God and bring the, the power back into the church so that people can be helped. Amen. Amen. One of the hardest things for me to do is to be booted out of a hospital. Not that I knew it for myself, but I can't go in even church members that have to go in a hospital, not necessarily for the COVID, but because of the COVID, we've got a, a you know, you, you, you go in there by yourself, you get through by yourself, and that's it by yourself. Uh, and nothing can, can, can uh, be done by it. Where I used to go in, and, and, and our, our parishioners, the people that know me, I'd go in and lay hands on them, heal them, and, 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 and deliver healing, encouragement, different things like that, where now it's kind of a, a restriction. Now listen to me, what the devil has tried to do to the church is shut it down and to quiet it up. God has just used other ways. <laughs> this message hasn't been silenced for 2,000 years, even, even longer. It's not going to be silenced anytime soon. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many got something out of the word this morning? Let's stand on our feet. I'll close in prayer. And then anybody needs wants prayer, I'll be available to pray for them this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the word that you've given us. I pray, Father God, that it heard, was heard with the heart this morning. Not with the head so much, but with the heart. Discerned in the heart, Father God, for in that we pray. Let the testimony of Jesus with the spirit of prophecy come past right now in the name of Jesus. The things that we said, maybe you got an encouragement as I was preaching. Maybe you brought something else to mind that was plaguing or bothering or whatever. Father, in the name of Jesus, we said, Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy, a testimony of the spirit of prophecy of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray the testimony of Jesus upon them. And, Lord, the change their circumstances now in the name of Jesus. Change the circumstances, Father, pray. Supernatural miracles in the name of God. We stand and believe according to God's word. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, bless these people for listening and receiving the message that you have given us this morning. And we thank you, Father God, for the church body. May we be an encouragement one to another, an uplifting one to another, and strengthening one to another. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And they said it, and they said it again. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.